Hi guys, here is your Kingdom Animalia, just introduction video. First, we're just going to touch very briefly on cell organelles and their functions. So cell organelles and their functions, you should be familiar with all of these items. If you're not, please go back and review your information from theme two. You should also be familiar with cell respiration. Remember, that's when glucose goes in and you get lots and lots of ATP as your end result. So now let's get into animals in general. What is an animal? So an animal is just a multicellular, eukaryotic, heterotroph whose cells lack cell walls. And here's just an example of all the many animals that are in this world. So there's some essential functions that animals can do. They can feed, since they're heterotrophs. Respiration, so they take oxygen in and they breathe carbon dioxide out. They have a circulatory system and diffusion across their membranes, if you remember cell membranes from first semester in theme two. They also do excretion, so this is just a byproduct of their metabolism. They have a nervous system, they're able to move through skeletons and muscles, and their reproduction is mostly sexual, although some can reproduce asexually. So then how are they classified? Well, there's two kinds, invertebrates and vertebrates. So our invertebrates do not have a backbone or vertebral column. This actually comprises 95% of animals. So these are things like insects, worms, jellyfish, sea stars. All of these are invertebrates, but they're still animals. Vertebrates, on the other hand, then, are animals that have a backbone. And as you can see, this is only 5% of animals. But chances are, if I were to ask you to name the first animal that comes to your mind, you'd probably name a vertebrate. We just tend to be more familiar with these animals. So in terms of body support, invertebrates have something called an exoskeleton, meaning outside. And this is just a hard, tough outer covering. So as this, you can see in this beetle here, it has an exoskeleton. That's why it sounds gross, but when you squish a bug, it usually crunches. Vertebrates, on the other hand, have endoskeletons, and this gives support for the body, but it's internal, like this fish here, and it helps with the muscles, for the muscles to attach and pull against. So in terms of body movement, <clears throat> um, animals can do two things. They can either move or not move. So mobile, motile, all those things refer to moving. They can use fins, feet, legs, wings, etc. Sessile like we'll talk about with sea anemones, for example, stay stationary during their adult life. They do usually move, though, when they are young. So there's also body plans that we need to discuss. So symmetry in general is just that similarity among body structures of organisms. Not everything, of course, is exactly the same. If you cut a human down the middle, they're not going to be absolutely symmetrical. That is not nature or natural. But that's still considered bilateral symmetry. Radial symmetry, on the other hand, is where you can divide the animal on many planes, like the jellyfish that you see here. And then asymmetry is things like the sponge. They really don't have any symmetry at all to them. So, in terms of bilateral symmetry, these are the animals that are usually more mobile. They have anterior and posterior ends, and they show something called cephalization, which is a really important term you need to know. And this is just simply the concentration of nerve endings in a head area, usually a brain or something similar. Animals that have cephalization are typically bilaterally symmetrical. So here's another just look at <clears throat> cephalization in a central nervous system. So you see these two animals here do not have a central nervous system. And things like a hydra, which is kind of like a sea anemone or a sea star. But look at this, flatworms leeches, and even insects, they have some form of a brain, so they do show cephalization. They're also bilaterally symmetrical. So let's do a quick quiz. So what type of symmetry here? If you guessed radial, you are correct. Here, bilateral. Here, remember sponges don't have anything, so it's asymmetry. A tiger, look at that, right down the middle. Bilateral, and a starfish, radial. And this, you may think, okay, they have five arms. How can that be? But you divide one of the arms in half. And then it's symmetrical no matter, oops, that one wasn't. But no matter which way you divide it, it's symmetrical. So in terms of the body arrangements, we also need to talk about the different surfaces of an animal. So these are four key words that you need to know. Dorsal and ventral. So dorsal is the back or upper surface. And that's really simple when you think of like a dolphin. Let's see. Uh-oh. Oh, no.
All right, when you think of a dolphin, for example, so dolphins have a dorsal fin, so dorsal is the back. Ventral, then, is the belly or the lower surface, and then anterior and posterior. So dorsal, ventral kind of go together, anterior, posterior. So posterior, someone might tell you to go sit on your posterior. They're telling you to sit on your butt or your tail or your hind end. So posterior is opposite of the head. So here's a look at that on a fish. So as you can see, these are the dorsal fins or the dorsal side of the fish. Ventral is the belly, posterior is the end, and anterior is the head. Another term that you should be familiar with is homeostasis. So quick review. Oh my gosh, this PowerPoint today. Quick review. A homeostasis is the ability to maintain a constant internal environment. Ugh. So endothermy versus ectothermy then is what we're going to talk about based on homeostasis. All right, so endothermy then is an organism that maintains an internal body temperature by generating its own heat. Like this polar bear here, so you'll see polar bears live out in the cold, but they're still able to control their body temperature. Ectothermy, on the other hand, is an organism that relies on interactions with the environment. So <clears throat> Zima, for example, gets really cold if he's not under his heat lamps. So when we talk about animal reproduction, I'm sure most of you are familiar with sperm, egg, and maybe zygote. So zygote is simply a fertilized female egg. Now, a hermaphrodite is an organism that can produce both sperm and egg in the same body. And there's two types of fertilization that you need to know. Internal is when the sperm and egg combine inside an animal's body. So you'll see mating similar to this here. That results in internal fertilization. External fertilization is when the sperm and egg combine outside of the animal's body like you see in this fish here. And this usually has to happen in an aquatic environment. This cannot just happen in the middle of the desert. So as you see, the female will lay her eggs and then the male comes and drops the sperm on the eggs and then they're fertilized and they grow into new fish. So after fertilization, this is something that's probably new to you. So you know about mitosis. So that zygote's going to go through mitosis, keep dividing, getting bigger, getting bigger. And something called a blastula is formed. So the blastula is simply a fluid-filled ball of cells. As it grows and divides, it eventually forms a gastrula. So this is a two-cell layer sac that has an opening at one end. So you can see this here is a blastula. And then a gastrula is when gastrulation occurs, which is the opening. And we'll talk about what that opening becomes in just a minute. So there are also three types of body tissues that you should know. Ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Now, they're all kind of self-explanatory based on their prefix, right? Ecto is out, endo is in, meso is middle. So ectoderm is then the outer layer of cells. This forms things like nervous tissue and skin. The mesoderm is between, of course, and it forms muscle, circulatory, and the excretory system. The endoderm is the inner layer of cells, and this is what forms the digestive organs. So let's talk about those body cavities then that are formed. So there's three kinds, acelomates, pseudocelomates, and coelomates. So acelomates, think of asymmetry, right? No symmetry. So an acelomate doesn't have a body cavity either. They're just a solid body. They don't have a circulatory system. They just kind of are there. Now, things like this are the flatworm. A pseudocelomate, pseudo, kind of like false or fake, they have a modified body cavity. It's not a real one, like the coelomates, but it's close. So it is fluid filled and it limits the tissue and organ development though. And an example here is the roundworm. The final is a coelomate and we're coelomates and lots of other animals are too. And this is the key to the ability to have those specialized organs and organ systems. And this is formed from the mesoderm. So examples here are you, of course, fish, insects, all of those things have a coelom. And here's just a closer look. You may want to pause this or print this out. So coelomate animals only, we're only talking about coelomates, can be two types based on what develops from that gastrula opening that I told you we'd get into more. You can either be a protostome or a deuterostome. And really the only difference is what develops first from that opening. So protostomes, the mouth develops first. And examples here are mollusks and arthropods. And deuterostomes, the anus develops first. And examples are echinoderms and chordates like us. So here's just a closer look at that. You see the blastula and you see this 
forming, the gastrulation forming, is it becomes a gastrula. So deuterostomes are us over here, and protostomes are these guys over here. And here's just a closer look at that happening. So you see starting at the eight cell stage, and then you see the development, and then you see the anus and the mouth. Now all of these animals have an anus and a mouth, but the difference is which one develops first. So something else animals have is segmentation. And this is the fact that animals are put together from different parts. And there's some really great advantages to this. First of all, you can survive damage to one segment because the other segments help out. If your arm gets chopped off, you're not going to die unless you die from loss of blood. But if you get immediate help, you're fine. And you also have better movement and flexibility because your segments can move independently. You can move your leg and just your leg. It's not like your arms move and your body moves too. It's just your leg. So the question then is, are we segmented? And the answer is yes. We are highly specialized as we're segmented, so it's really hard to actually see our segments like you would see in this earthworm here, but we are segmented. Another thing we need to talk about is metamorphosis. So this is a series of changes as an organism goes from egg to adult, and there's two types. There's incomplete and complete. So incomplete is up here, and it's basically like an egg makes a little mini adult, and then you have an adult. A complete metamorphosis is like the monarch butterfly, for example. So the larva, which is kind of like a caterpillar worm, looks severely different from the adult. So there are, these are the major chordates that we're going to discuss. So we have agnatha, which is jawless fish, chondrichthys, cartilage fish, osteichthys, bony fish, amphibia, amphibians, reptilia, reptiles, aves, birds, and mammalia, mammals. And here's just a look at how the cladogram looks for these organisms. So as you can see, you have the very ancestral species here, our periphera, nidaria. And then as we keep going, we get to chordates. So chordates are considered some of the most highly evolved animals. And that is all for your notes. We will talk about those kingdoms in class and more in depth.